A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there existed this strange, nerdy and wonderful phenomenon. These nice, geeky computer fellas used to slave away making the best video game they could, and then because of good old-fashioned pre-SG capitalism, getting a bunch of business types to try and sell it in the marketplace. These were simpler, more innocent times. Sadly, these days you have to wade through several miles of waist-deep bullshit and one of the world's biggest PSYOP initiatives in order just to find and buy a video game. And if the reviews are anything to go by, the majority of all mainstream video games these days are shite. And there appears to be a complete schism between the mainstream corporate review industry and the opinions of the actual gamers who frequently no longer are best described as the customers of the AAA publishers, but rather the victims. But despite living in these strange times full of corruption and deception, I managed to find several superb and cheap games recently. War Tales and The Long Dark. So they are still out there, even if they might not be brand new and plastering the headlines which is frankly often a positive indicator. It's getting harder and harder these days to filter out all the background marketing white noise and find a decent game that is enjoyable without getting ripped off in the process. So I thought, why not try and make a useful video for once, drawing together my own personal factoids, the wisdom I have gleaned from the comment section, sage advice I've seen on the internet, so it must be true, and formulate a guide, a manual if you will, about how to buy a video game in the age of modernity, how to find good games, how to pay the least amount of money, how to avoid getting stung, and how to avoid getting manipulated into making bad purchasing decisions. So I guess before we proceed, it would be useful to define the main actors in this tragic comedy. There is the aspiring customer, ergo the gamer. That's the part you play, FY fucking I. You want to buy the best possible game for the least amount of money. You want to find it. You want it to work properly. It's frankly rude if it doesn't. You want the least amount of fuckery, hidden costs and rug pulls. You are a simple, uncomplicated person swimming in a sea of sharks and bullshit, who just wants to hand over some hard-earned cash in exchange for a worthy product. Something to entertain you, and hopefully not try and indoctrinate you. This means you are required, directly or indirectly, to interface with the AAA video publishing industry. Another player in this pantomime. This bunch are generally scummy, untrustworthy, and duplicitous fucks with very few exceptions. Possibly Coffee Stain Studios, possibly Devolver Digital, not sure. Even the nice ones might be burying corpses in the office garden for all I know. Despite publishers' lofty claims of benevolence and the seemingly endless stream of dishonest appeals to your better nature, they are about as trustworthy as a paroled groomer working in a kindergarten. The publishers have an almost diametrically opposed agenda to the gamer. Their job is to absolutely maximise profit at any cost, even if that cost is ripping off the gamer, destroying their own reputation and crushing their own brand. Like a robot's prime directive, their mantra is make the most amount of profit for the least amount of investment. Now on the odd, very rare occasion, that metric can mean investing enough money to make a really good game that becomes a blockbuster and makes huge chunks of cash, thus paying dividends on that investment. But sadly these days, most of the time, it manifests as selling the least amount of game for the most amount of money, even if that means spending more money on advertising than they do on the game's development, lying to everyone, releasing a pile of crap, and then saying, sorry... We also have the indie developer, allegedly a bit player, but in my humble opinion a very important one, even if their main function is to be part of the churn of the video game industry. That is to say the churn of setting up an indie studio, getting successful, 
being bought out by a AAA publisher, becoming part of the mainstream until enough people have left and they set up another indie studio. And thus the cycle of renewal continues. Ad fucking infinitum. But I digress. In theory an indie developer is like the good old days. Poor little devs, working to make a great game, struggling against the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and then ultimately being forced to find the least corrupt publisher to sell their game when it's finished. Now sometimes this is true. Sometimes this is one of several degrees of deceit. You see, indie is a rather vague and nebulous term, which could be applied to anything from a small outfit like Iron Gate Studio all the way down to a alleged little developer like Shiro Games, who whilst claiming to be a small independent studio from Bordeaux, France, the place having a civil war, but yet somehow managed to do some behind the scenes deal with Tencent, the smiley face of the CCP, getting the rights to make the new Doom game and getting a $55 million investment from Cathay Capital. So it certainly appears our little French indie might actually be partially owned or at least be massively capitalised by the Chinese government and a capital investment platform which is a jointly owned French and Chinese operation. Shiro Games' current net worth is in excess of a hundred million euros. I mention both of these developers pointedly because they both have made games that I really liked and charged a fair price for them. I'm just warning you that just because a developer claims to be indie does not bestow virtue upon their video game nor afford them trust or special treatment automatically. The label of indie is frequently just a narrative these days. It's like a brand. It's like putting pictures of farms on your packets of cheese. It's just marketing. We see that on the label we feel a bit more confident. But let's have a look at what a farm really looks like. It probably looks like that. Now this is a concentrated animal feeding operation. I'm going to run that past you again. It's a concentrated animal feeding operation. That's not going to look great on a label. Hence we use farm fresh. So don't trust an indie game just because it's called an indie. It might just be a cheaper, more modest game made by an offshoot subsidiary of a monolithic AAA publishing house. The last but absolutely least player involved with all of this, on the moral spectrum at least, are the reviewers. The vast majority, all of which are on the take. Seriously, don't believe me? Well, when Redfall was already burning in the dumpster fire of video game failure, Bethesda allegedly just organised hundreds of meetings at its offices globally, flew in every last YouTuber and reviewer who was easily enticed by a free jolly to another city, paid flights and expenses, free hotel rooms, and most likely a whole bucket load of other inducements. And when they came back, they all said Redfall was a lovely game, and only a couple of them even managed to notice, or should I say mention, that Redfall was a massive pile of fuck. This would certainly beg the conclusion that the YouTube reviewing community is rather easily bought off. Mainstream video game journalism is literally bankrolled by advertising revenue from the AAA video game industry, so you can't trust them. Many reviewers rely on early access pre-release copies of the game and access to VIPs for leveraging their audience metrics, so you can't trust them. And sadly, most YouTube reviewers, however much she doth protest, are on the payroll too. Maybe it's gifts, maybe it's access, maybe it's just wads of cash, but paying off reviewers is part of marketing budgets. So either all the money is magically disappearing as it leaves the building, or somebody is putting it in their pockets. What do you think? And don't for a second be fooled into thinking that any particular YouTuber is unbiased because they broke ranks, publicly criticised a publisher or gave a certain game a bad review once. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Not to mention that I know factually that sometimes big YouTubers will take a swipe at a publisher as a tactical show of force to leverage a better payday the next time they are required to do some marketing for them. 
So there you have the cast in this dysfunctional story. There is you, and every single other player is either against you, might be untrustworthy, or makes a living by blowing smoke up your arse. I guess we also need to quickly discuss the operating environment that you will be working in as a gamer, or potential customer. I could probably best describe it as a pit of vipers. Gone are the days when video game reviewers were valued for their journalistic integrity and their expertise. These days, we have woke tarts reviewing cyberpunk, who literally brag about not really playing much of it and writing a review based on misogyny. This is not the good old days where you can just trundle off to some forum and get sound advice from your gaming peers, trusting they are who they appear to be. Reddit used to have rules banning publishers from running and or colluding with subreddits to manipulate opinions and service sales. Not anymore. I guess as part of its mad rush to commercialise and monetize more of its operations so they can sell themselves off before the next big tech bubble crash, Reddit stopped enforcing these rules, and I think they have now scrapped them altogether. Your supposedly unbiased and impartial subreddit for your favourite video game more likely than not is owned, run and manipulated by the publishers and or the developer. Based on personal experience and tip-offs, I discovered the following things going on in the gaming subreddits. The admins are colluding with the publisher and enforcing the publisher's censorious directives. Sometimes this involves banning people altogether, or just deleting or hiding certain posts. Sometimes they use megathreads, which is a euphemism for hoovering up every single negative or complaint post and shoving it in the fucking corner. It's not really hard to manipulate admins. Most of them do it for free. So chucking in a few mouse mats and a holiday visit to the studio must be a bonanza if you're working out of your bedroom in Puerto Rico. Also, you have no idea who you were talking to on a subreddit. Sometimes the community managers are honest about breaking the rules and just administrate the subreddit themselves with their own names in their bio. Sometimes they have sock puppet accounts. I have no doubt that many community managers by default post on multiple accounts so they can show up either in school uniform or undercover when they need to manipulate the angry crowd. Christ, I bet the community manager's training manual probably has several chapters about sock puppet accounts, social manipulation and subversion. One time when I was covering the Division franchise I encountered a rather vexed individual who seemed profoundly offended by my rather charming videos. The most interesting point being, he presented himself as a player. But little did he know, I happen to know, 100%, he was actually a Ubisoft developer pretending to be a civilian. Yeah, how about them apples? Now many developers lurk on subreddits on personal accounts and that is fine, often this is entirely understandable. They want to interact with the audience anonymously, they want to speak to the community, they want to be able to get feedback whilst not being on a company account and potentially get fired for saying something that isn't on message. There are a myriad of innocent and justifiable reasons why devs would lurk on their own subreddits and do so anonymously. But that is very different from conducting company business, trying to silence your critics, and running crowd control, whilst not divulging your conflict of interest. Deciding where to draw the line between benign anonymity and sock puppetry is a whole video game university lecture right there. But I will let you theorycraft that one yourselves. The important point here is this. If you think you're going to a video game subreddit for an honest discussion and some unbiased views, you are fucking deluding yourself. Most of the people running the subreddit are compromised. There are undercover agents of the company posting there and the whole thing is controlled opposition that exists to give you the illusion of open and honest debate. Now I am not saying this happens on all subreddits, nor all of the time but it is absolutely rife. And if you look hard enough, start checking people's post history, eventually you'll see it for yourselves. For example, one time I noticed a bunch of shiny happy people 
enthusiastically encouraging everyone on a subreddit to be more optimistic and positive about a game's shit show abysmal launch. But it was all a bit strange. After checking through a bunch of these accounts, I noticed that a huge swathe of them were all set up at precisely the same time, many months before launch. They all made a few random posts, then went dark until launch day. Then suddenly they burst back into life in unison. I don't work in marketing, but I would speculate this. They were a bunch of sock puppet accounts, all opened by either the community managers or a promotion company, and then parked so that they had some vague aura of respectability and plausibility so that they could be activated later and used for psyops on the subreddit when the game fell flat on its arse. Following from this, don't even get me started about official video game forums, they own those. Be too openly critical about an issue and the banhammer will come down. Following from this, official discords can largely be a joke too. Ubisoft started insta-banning people for merely criticising any aspect of The Division 2, so you were dreaming if you thought you could get a good understanding of the game and the community by hanging out on their Discord. Negative people got kicked off in the name of positivity. Now add to all of this, review aggregator sites are now completely bent. Social Manipulation 101 If you want to control the narrative, assign a pejorative to a specific opinion, morally load it with negativity, and then you can claim the moral high ground when you try and stamp out anyone expressing that view. This is not a tactic confined to social media debates. What I am referring to here is review bombing. The ascendancy of the concept of review bombing is, I will reluctantly admit, a masterstroke of PR genius. And here is how it works. A publisher will piss everyone off by doing something terrible with a game, or releasing a terrible game. Then rightly and justifiably, they get arse banged in the reviews, and the review aggregators show the game's review ratings tank. This is how it's all supposed to work. Do something shitty, get shit on. And thus the harmony of the world is maintained. However, then the big entertainment companies had a moment of pure inspirational genius. They started promoting the narrative of review bombing and peddling the notion that it was some combination of organised protest, it was unfair, not representative of the real score, whatever the fuck that means, harming their commercial operations, that it had a moral dimension. This was nasty bad people giving unfair reviews out of spite and they needed protection from the nasty unfair review bombers. Check the Wikipedia page, it's fucking mind blowing. It likens review bombing to some form of Timothy McVeigh like political insurrection. Put simply, review bombing has the word bombing in it. Of course, this was a phrase designed to disenfranchise and smear the people posting negative reviews. Think I'm making too much of this? Well, the term review bombing originated from a 2008 Ars Technica article by Ben Kachira. Yes, that Ars Technica. The publication where Kyle Orland used to be senior gaming editor. You remember him, right? He was one of the principal architects of Gamergate and the progenitor of the Gamers Are Dead campaign. The dude who ran the Game Journo Pros journalist group that orchestrated the entire Gamers Are Evil racist narrative to subvert the narrative about corrupt video game journalists. So yeah, when I found out that the entire paradigm of review bombing can all be traced back to the pre-Gamergate hotbed of Ars Technica, it all basically made a lot of sense. Well, with enough legal, commercial and advertising pressure, corporations convinced aggregator sites to introduce special measures to deal with, and I quote, review bombing, like it's a real fucking thing, like it's a malevolent entity, that doesn't represent the real score. A form of online bullying, if you will. 
This all is basically a massive euphemistic strategy for corporations to openly put pressure on review aggregator sites to massage the bloody scores, delete negative reviews, manipulate the ratings and generally step in and cook the books if some game, movie or TV show is getting hammered for essentially being shit. Basically review bombing was the excuse that was used for review sites to blatantly manipulate the review scores legally without committing fraud. It's hilarious. Now you can sit there deleting negative reviews and turn around and say, oh no, I'm not censoring negative reviews, I'm dealing with those nasty review bombers. Genius. Evil, disgusting, but genius. It's as crafty as Sweeney Todd's barber chair. I can't say it's very pleasant, but you have to admire the ingenuity. Metacritic holds back user reviews until at least 24 hours after launch these days, and it might be longer by now. The important thing is, no pesky customers can warn other customers it shit on launch day. After all, what's important here? We have to protect those poor corporations from losing money when they release an utterly fucked game. Am I right? As I said, this is not the good old days. These are no longer innocent times, where small software companies battle to make the best possible game and physically sell it on physical shelves, and the marketplace decides who wins and who fails. The industry is over 30 years old now, grown up. It has matured. It has gone ripe. It has fucking festered. This is no longer about fair play, journalistic integrity or any semblance of accuracy. The publishers are trying to win by any means. The big takeaway here is this. Gamers exist and operate in the middle of a theatre of lies, and pretty much the entire spectrum of news will be trying to sell you the game. Not tell you about the game, not review the game, and certainly not give an honest fucking opinion of the game. From announcement, through development, over the launch, and throughout the whole marketing cycle, nearly all the news and feedback you will see anywhere will be marketing and not news. The two main things I personally look out for happen way after launch, and to really get a good read you need to wait about two to three weeks. Overwhelmingly positive feedback from the customers across all channels and in bulk. I'm talking about when there are thousands of reviews up on Steam, not hundreds, and they're all gushing praise. Think Elden Ring. And the other more common phenomenon is where in the aftermath of the hype, promotion and media fanfare, the game releases and there is customer outrage. The peasants are in the town square, waving pitchforks and scythes. Everyone is demanding refunds. They're trying to find a witch to burn at the stake, and the developer is promising that right now, they're working on a patch that will magically fix everything. Think Cyberpunk 2077. Battlefield 20 fucking fuck. Fallout get to fuck 76. I could write a list of games here, but you know what I'm talking about. Too often games are being drenched with praise until the moment they're released. The customers go into uproar, then eventually the mainstream journalists quietly change their opinions once the streets are burning and gently join in with the dogpiling. So let's talk about actual strategies and advice that can help you buy a game. There are a host of strategies you can employ to both avoid shitting your money into the wallets of grifter corporations like EA or inveterate woke ESG snivelling gaslighters like Neil Cuckman. This is largely down to following a few simple rules, doing a little bit of research and boxing clever when it comes to finding good games, as opposed to passively absorbing media hype and marketing. Never ever pre-order, unless there is a really good reason. And even then, don't. I shit ye not, brethren. 75% of all gamer-related strife could be immediately neutralised if gamers just stopped pre-ordering video games. And yes, like all internet statistics, I pulled that percentage right out of my ass. 
Maybe it's 50%, maybe it's 82%, but for the sake of simplicity and clarity, I'm just going to stick with three quarters. Pre-ordering video games is like volunteering for a uber catfishing, and what is worse is that you know that most of the time video games fail to live up to the hype. In fact, most of the games I have enjoyed this year were not hyped. They were older or low key. There are simple basic concepts that are not hard to grasp. Don't buy stuff you haven't seen first, or hasn't been released, or isn't even finished yet. Why participate in launch day disasters and day one server crashes? Why play a game before the first patch? Why pay full price? Why pay before the jury is in on whether the game lives up to the expectations? Why be the dumbass red shirt from a horror movie? When someone says, I think I heard a noise coming from down that tunnel, why volunteer to be the first schmuck to go down and check it out yourself? This is blindingly obvious advice. So simple, so well understood, so well known, yet so repeatedly ignored at the last minute by the very people who promote it. Like Dr. Rudy's dieting advice. I have a 100% guaranteed weight loss regime. It always works. It's very simple. All you have to do is eat less. Two words, eat less. But remember, eating less will not work unless you actually eat less. This advice works too, but it only works if you actually don't pre-order. Don't fucking pre-order and don't make an exception on this or that game because reasons. That's how they catch you. It's like Starfield. Everyone is coming in their pants over the latest reveals and suffering a case of mass psychosis and collective cultural amnesia. Because, of course, Starfield looks great and it may end up being great. And I genuinely hope that it is great. But dear fucking lord, don't trust that the game will be great and pre-order. Bethesda lies. That's what they do. There will be problems. Server issues. Launch day bugs are inevitable. So why take it on faith that this time, this time, Todd Howard won't be lying? Because he's been fucking lying for decades now. There are supercut videos of him lying throughout his whole career. Just remember Fallout 76, dear lord. That was going to be great too. So exercise some self-control, avoid the launch day shit show, let the dust settle, let the patches get launched, wait for thousands of customer reviews to come out, let other people go over the top and charge the trenches first, let them be free beta testers. Besides, the price of games only goes down over time. So why pay top dollar for maximum shit show? Why pay £70? when you can pay less later for a patched game that comes with lots of user reviews. The only people who should be pre-ordering games are reviewers who are out of favour with the marketing departments. Just don't pre-order games. It is a monumental act of self-betrayal, a demonstration of poor impulse control, and the more people pre-order, the more publishers release broken games. Anyone who pre-orders is literally bankrolling the acceptability of launch day catastrophes. Let's not forget that many AAA flops are still profitable because of the pre-orders. This is a strange and slightly unrelated case, but I'm in charge so I'm going to bring it up, because it kind of relates to pre-ordering stuff, and that is Game of Thrones. If I had waited until the last season was out, I would never have started buying the Blu-rays. Now I have seven seasons of the damn show, and I will never buy the abysmal season eight. If I had just been smart enough to let it all play out before splashing the cash, I could have saved myself a lot of grubby notes. Wait until the facts are in before making your purchasing decisions. It's a fundamental law of the universe. Never get on the hype train. It is sad how often I see people comment on a shit game by saying something along the lines of 
I normally don't pre-order, but this time it looked so good. Well, ain't that the bloody point? The whole purpose of marketing campaigns is to encourage you to buy something based on emotion and not logic. That is the whole point. They want you to buy it without knowing if it's good. And usually, your only rewards for pre-ordering are 1. Some unique weapon or lucky gonk for your backpack. 2. The privilege of paying the absolute most amount of money the game will ever cost. 3. The luxury of jumping to the front of the queue of fucking idiots so you can experience the crushing disappointment and feelings of regret as soon as is absolutely possible. Think about that. 95% of the time these days, pre-ordering is very literally paying extra so you can be disappointed sooner. Where's the benefit in that? If you were on death row, would you pay cash money to jump to the front of the queue and test out the slightly unreliable prototype electric chair, which possibly might require a couple of attempts to finish you off? No. Well, I hope not at least. Why not loiter at the back? Don't pay money to add to your own misery. And why participate at all if there is an option to basically hang around and see how much of a good time the other rapist murderers have? And then opt out of the situation entirely if you so decide. Now, I am not suggesting for a second that you are all rapist murderers. I am merely noting that if you pre-order, then you are paying extra to put yourself in a worse position and nullifying your possibility of opting out if the game turns out to be shit. So don't join the hype train. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Just practice the policy of waiting to see if the game lives up to the hype. Let's not forget that advertising campaigns are like New Year's resolutions. They are a manifesto forged out of hope, intentions, and largely fantasy and fucking delusion. My New Year's resolutions this year were become the fittest man in the world by February. Climb Mount Everest twice. Learn how to be a ninja. Become an astronaut. Well, it's July, and I'm still sitting here in my pants like a fat fuck, shoveling pies into my face hole whilst my greasy fingers are grasping the mouse as I surf porn. Shockingly, I've not had a single telephone call from NASA yet. Video game marketing campaigns are selling you the fantasy of the game you want. Well, I fantasise about a lot of things, some of them legal, but if I'm paying cash money, I want to see the goods up front, before I hand over the greens. Just look at the disgraceful lack of composure and self-restraint surrounding the Starfield hype. Thus far, we only have Todd Little Lies Howard's Little Lies, and some carefully choreographed cinematics and curated gameplay snippets. But people are already calling it, buying into the hype and encouraging others to do the same. It's a bloody amazing game, apparently. Not that anyone has spent a day playing it publicly. Just wait for a few weeks after launch. If it's really that good, you will only jizz yourself harder when you buy it a month after release. If it's shit, you'll just laugh harder and spend that £70 on something more sensible, like cider or blowjobs. Starfield is like the Schrodinger's cat experiment. Until we actually open the box, we will not know if the box contains something wonderful or just a fucked cat. But just like so much of modern gaming systems, the publisher is exploiting fantasy, narrative, addiction, dopamine cycles and impatience to encourage people to adopt a feeling about what is in the box instead of waiting for someone to open it so you can look see for yourself. Hype trains are for teenage girls and K-pop fans. Grow up for fuck's sake. I cannot believe that after the epoch defining shit bucket of Fallout 70 fucking T-pose, people are not flatly opting out of any and all hype surrounding Starfield and merely calmly saying, I will believe it when I see it, Todd. You fucking shit heel liar. I want to believe it too. I want Starfield to be my next Fallout 3 or New Vegas. 
only in space, with fatty astronauts and space lasers. I want to believe it. But I'm not going to, because I don't have to. I can wait until after release. I will make my judgments based on the facts when they are presented, not because the shit weasel in chief just said so. Do not get emotionally invested. Video games are like cars, not like books. What do I mean by this? If James S.A. Corey announces he is releasing a new book in the Expanse series, then it is completely understandable that you might rush out and buy it on launch day and rapaciously hoover it up through your squinty eyeballs. You already own all the other books in the series, right? You are desperate for more Expanse lore, right? You love James S.A. Corey, even though he is actually two different people writing collaboratively under a pen name, right? This behavioural mechanic makes sense. It is understandable and functional. It's not like you love the series but you're going to skip books 3 and 5 because they got bad reviews. But you should not behave the same way about, for example, cars. Just because your last two cars were from the same manufacturer, it makes no sense to demonstrate addictive brand loyalty and buy their next new car as well without knowing anything about it, just because you like that brand, so therefore you will automatically trust the next model to be good too. This makes no sense. And video games are like cars, not books. Just because The Last of Us 1 was good, it makes no sense to buy The Last of Us 2 based on assumption, brand loyalty, completionism or faith in the developer. The first game had a great story and was conceived by a great game writer. The second game was an ESG shit sandwich conceived by a maniacal egomaniac. There was never any logical grounds to assume that there would be any continuity here at all. Don't get emotionally invested in creative projects that are designed by committee, bankrolled by predators and might not even have the same staff working at the company anymore. Arcane Studios made Dishonored, but they also made Redfall. If you want a stark lesson in why video game brand loyalty is a fallacy, well there it is, writ large. Check and know your refund policy. When I buy a game on Steam, I literally set an alarm for two hours when I launch it, so I know when my refund window is closing down and I am routinely grateful for doing this. I have bought games, tested them, refunded them, come back a few months later, discovered they were still broken and refunded them again. Just remember that sometimes they might refund after longer than two hours, but this is highly discretionary and based on the status and spend of your account. So there is no harm trying after two hours, but dear god, always play safe and don't rely on their kind grace. Some stores and online vendors have entirely different refund policies than the digital purchase. In fact, buying a game digitally direct from the publisher is frequently the least likely way to safeguard a possible refund. Do the research every time you buy a game and get it from the place which offers the best refund policy and the lowest price. Your wish list is your most powerful tool. Well, after self-control, of course. Wish lists are godly. Let's take it on faith that you have the self-discipline to avoid pre-ordering, while the next phase is to entirely disconnect your relationship between when a game is released and when you actually buy it. I first bought and tried The Long Dark this year. It's years old, but it's still superb. I bought it for cheap, absolutely loved it. It's almost literally 10 times the game it was when it was first released, most of the bugs are gone and they are still releasing content. As they say in The Mandalorian, every 45 seconds, this is the way. But don't bother watching Mandalorian unless you like to see lead male-ish heroes cucked by supporting actresses and fucking Muppets. Seriously guys. Why did everyone fall for this bloody micro plushie? It's embarrassing. My point is, use your Steam wishlist, wait for seasonal sales like the summer sale, 
It is an incredibly powerful tool where you can just add games you fancy, be patient, and in two to six months time get a notification telling you it's half price. Christ, at the time of writing, Shadow of War is five quid. Destroy All Humans is six quid. Plague Tales Innocence is seven quid. When you consider the timescales involved and the huge potential discounts, this little bit of patience is the best return on your money you will ever see outside of a robbery, a lottery ticket, or a crypto scam. Other platforms are doing it too now. My Xbox Game Pass thing launcher lets me store a wish list. Nice of them considering they're about to put the price up. As predicted. Fuckers. Think about that. They release Redfall. Say sorry. Then a few weeks later raise the price of Game Pass. More rug pulls incoming, I guarantee. That is certainly the last time I have private times with pictures of Sarah Bond. Jazz hands or no. On top of this, there are Amazon wish lists and other wish lists. Just park a game in the list and let the vendor engage you in a one sided bidding war where you only press buy when you can pick it up for peanuts. To use a very personal example, I'm one of the original Division refugees who played the franchise from just after the launch of the first game. I paid full price for The Division 2, full price for Warlords of New York DLC, which was supposed to be free content. And it turned out to be cut content from the original game, allegedly. Well, here are two pertinent facts that support the notion that patience and self-discipline reward you with free money and contentment. 1. You can buy the whole job lot, The Division 2 plus Warlords, right now, for 20 quid. 2. A common thing I see in the comments section is, I bought The Division 2 for peanuts in a sale and enjoyed myself. My point is that you can enjoy a shit sandwich if you bought it on a 70% discount. And after it's all been patched, all the content that will ever be in the game is already implemented. That said, The Witcher 3 Complete Edition is currently on sale for 8 quid, so buy that instead. Don't misunderstand me, I am NOT saying buy The Division 2 when it's on sale. I'm just pointing out that buying a highly problematic game for a few quid a couple of years after launch can theoretically be a good deal. Retro games are pure win. Not only are many older games still fucking awesome, like the decade old Long Dark or Witcher 3, if the underlying game mechanics and or story are sound, you might actually enjoy playing retro or at least older games. Whatever their age. I would however note, personally I try to stick with the sequence rule. I made this rule up, but it sounds professional at least, and it goes something like this. If you, for example, pick up all the Fallout franchise in a sale, personally I would advise you play them in sequence, starting with the first and moving chronologically through them. There is nothing stopping you from just buying Fallout 2 and loving it. I merely advise this because stories, lore and plot tends to thread through the game chronologically, but particularly because quality of life and functionality tends to improve over time. An example would be the Metro franchise. I would start with Metro 2033, the Redux version, then play Metro Last Light, the Redux version, and finish with Metro Exodus. I think all the games are excellent and stand the test of time as standalone episodes, but I always recommend playing them in chronological order if you're getting the whole lot in one batch purchase because it helps you avoid that uncanny valley effect associated with diminishing functionality and quality of life. There is just something slightly weird about playing a game that is eerily similar to the one you just played where you were constantly wanting to do stuff which was introduced in the next game but doesn't exist in the previous one. Personally I find something odd about the combination of familiarity and degraded functionality. Maybe I'm just weird. I am weird. Let's move on. Probably. Talking of which, Metro is the perfect example of the heritage slash semi-retro game. The franchise started a decade ago. The first two games cost about 
two bucks on Steam right now. I honestly think there's something like £1.50 each, and you get to play the final patched full versions of the game. See how nice that is? Another benefit of being patient. You get to play the Redux or Game of the Year version of games for literally pennies by not rushing to the front of the death row queue. Be very wary of any pay to play or freemium games. These are a seductive trap. Like the free bottle of champagne they try and give you in a strip club, it's not really free. You'll pay heavily for it later. These games are designed to suck you in, create massive levels of engagement and emotional investment, have an unending game loop so you never ever cap everything, then they exponentially increase the grind and progress requirements whilst all the while whispering in your ear with the silky words of, go on, spend a little money. After all, you are playing this game for free. I shit ye not, this business model is precisely and literally the same business model that was developed by fucking heroin dealers on council estates. You move into an area, offer your drugs for cheap or free, and as people become addicted, you start to increase the price. Believe it when I say, people end up dropping thousands of pounds on games like World of Tanks and they kid themselves that it's somehow okay because it's free to play, right? Just don't forget that the foundation of a lot of modern mobile game monetization and video game monetization and loot boxes was all forged in the crucible of free to play games. Do not trust YouTubers, not even the ones you trust. Now, this is the part of the video where I will crush your dreams and probably make you cynical about some of your alleged heroes and hopefully make a few of you cry. If I was forced at gunpoint to come up with a list of video game YouTube channels that I could 100% vouch were completely honest, transparent and uncorrupt, I couldn't name five. Obviously, I'm talking about big, decent size channels. I literally would struggle to come up with a list of YouTube reviewers who were not in some way influenced, compromised, bribed, paid, or in some other way unable to speak their mind freely or happy to massage the truth for the sake of expediency. Sadly, one of the tragic and most ironic compliments I ever get from people are statements to the effect of you and X are the only YouTubers I trust. And I read the name of the other YouTuber and shake my fucking head. Because invariably, it is someone I know factually to be a shill. I was lucky enough to have all my dreams crushed and get all of my crying out of the way very early on and learned in the early days of being a gamer and then a YouTuber that most people will lie to their audience's faces about pretty much anything, as long as the money is good enough. One of my first ever Hero Battlefield YouTubers got caught red-handed running hacks, and I watched how his audience just gobbled up his gaslighting in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. He was totally cheating. I was privileged enough to actually have been shown the evidence, and it is beyond refute. Several other YouTubers I avidly followed with bright-eyed, worshipping stares, while they were exposed in several cash-for-review scandals. They are a bit more subtle these days, and inducements are frequently channeled via promotion companies so that the YouTuber has plausible deniability, but it's just the same shit done more discreetly. And don't even get me started about my time covering the Division franchise, where I learned the cynical truth that the bigger the YouTuber covering the game, the higher the probability they were locked into some kind of NDA enforced deal with Ubisoft. And that is being kind. Ubisoft had that shit locked down tight. Allegedly. Now the relationship between gaming YouTubers and the publishers range on a scale broadly somewhere between nuanced and downright fucking shill sellout scab. On a scale of 0 to 10 we can pretty broadly say that there are very few zeros who have any significant following. And that often is because of burning their bridges by speaking their minds. This is going to shock you, but 
There just ain't that many worth buys and upper echelons out there. There just aren't that many large channels that refuse to take the king's shilling and peddle product. I'm a tiny channel, and even I get sponsorship offers regularly. Now the reason I say that the influence ranges from nuanced to all-out corruption is this. There is a career trajectory that a lot of new YouTubers get embroiled in, and there but for the grace of God go any of us. You start out small, getting 10 views a week, work your ass off, and you are bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. You're basically a fucking idiot. Your channel starts to grow a bit, you start engaging with the community, and if, if you're one of the shiny happy people, suck up to the community managers and devs and generally seem like an enthusiastic candidate, they will engage you directly. Now many young channels do this because they're genuinely enthusiastic about the game and want to get closer to the devs and community managers to get the hot scoops. Although let's be honest, this is to make more informed content, to get the inside skinny, which will help grow the channel. But let's not lie about the fact that there is a dimension of complete self-interest here. Now here is where it starts to get complicated. The next thing you know, the community managers are doing you little favours in exchange for keeping the narrative on message. Community managers are grooming you to be a star player or some other ambassador for the game. And there is an unwritten and sometimes written quid pro quo where as long as you stay positive about the game, nice things will happen to you. Now if you keep your head in the game, you're getting good metrics, they might even splash a bit of cash with YouTube to send traffic your way. They'll give you shout outs on social media or recommend your videos in their podcasts or live streams. They might invite you to events where your job is to squeak gleefully about stuff. Basically, the more you behave like a good little doggy, the more scraps you get thrown from the table. And if you do it well enough for long enough, eventually they might let you sit by their feet. Then sometimes a day comes where the YouTuber has a moment of clarity and realises, I can't say what I really think anymore. That is not really my job anymore. My full time job is pleasing my masters, growing my channel and getting free stuff given to me. It all started out so innocently with that one little white lie in exchange for that favour that time. But over time they transform into part of the marketing machinery of the publisher. It's a very simple dynamic and I've seen it happen to people. As channels grow they tend to form increasing relationships with the developers and publishers. Because of this good things happen and this helps channel growth. Because of this myriad of professional relationships, more and more you have to watch what you say, pull your punches and be economical with the truth. You offer a thumb but you lose the whole hand. I said sometimes about the moment of clarity because I've brushed shoulders with some of these guys and believe me, most of them don't overthink it. Their internal monologue just says, yay, free stuff and channel promotion yo, all I have to do is bullshit a bit here and bullshit a bit there and I make boku dollar. They don't give a fuck, lying is part of the business right? It is marketing after all. This being said, I've heard a few anecdotal stories of YouTubers who did suddenly have the self-awareness to have a moment of clarity and realise they were now corrupt. And boy oh boy, did they have a hard time extricating themselves from all the NDAs, blackmail and corporate leverage. My point is that this all starts out seemingly innocently, with a naive content creator trying to build relationships with game makers, but nevertheless ends badly. Just like that scale of 0 to 10 on the corruption scale. One is where the creator first puts their foot on the first step of the escalator and then they are steadily and inevitably carried upwards until they're at 10. The zeros are the people who either choose not to get on at all, got pushed off for speaking truth to power or just sacked the whole fucking thing and went and got a proper job. Now I claim no moral virtue here. I'm not honest because I'm morally superior to anyone and I certainly don't speak my mind because I'm virtuous. I am like this because if I behaved like that, making videos would be 
just like any other fucking desk job. And there are vastly easier ways to make more money for less effort in the marketing industry. I guess I could also add that I'm such an obnoxious fuckbag that publishers wouldn't touch me with a 10 foot shitty pole. I don't trust those fucks. They hate my guts. It's the perfect relationship because I can say what I like and I don't have to worry about hurting anyone's feelings. To put all of this collusion into perspective, I once DM'd a community manager about an issue with a relatively obscure game. I don't know if he was drunk or high, but during that brief exchange, he let slip the following. He had heard about me. Read into that what you will. Despite being on the other side of the planet, working for a different developer and publisher, he was friendly with another community manager that hates my guts. And then for reasons I will never be able to fully fathom, they also let slip that they just had a marketing meeting with a YouTuber that I knew. A YouTuber, incidentally, that is frequently cited as one of the good guys, one of the last bastions of integrity in the YouTube community. How I fucking laughed. You don't have meetings with community managers if you are not on the take in some form or another. There is a giant web of relationships between community managers, developers, publishers, marketing firms and gaming YouTubers. And I would also note that nearly all community managers seem to know all of the other community managers, whatever publisher they work for. But the magic word here is relationships. Because even if a YouTuber is not yet cashing his shill checks at the bank, the mere presence of a relationship, be that for access, information or inside leaks, is inherently problematic. Setting aside the fact that this is, after all, tradable information of value, but even if it's innocent, it's a problem because of human nature. It's why judges recuse themselves in cases involving friends and family. It's why members of parliament have to, by law, declare gifts and presents. It's why police officers go to other towns to take class A drugs and screw prostitutes. If your girlfriend walks into the room and asks, does this dress make me look ugly? You're not going to tell her the truth because you have a relationship. You might not even fucking like her, but you will still lie for an easy life. Even if it's because you don't want to hurt her feelings, because then she won't do shit for you. You will most likely be flexible with the truth and generous with your opinion, even if the dress makes her look like a fucking swamp beast. Same goes for content creators. If you're pals with some developer, and they do some shitty thing like introduce loot boxes, most people will feel conflicted about how to report on that. They will experience cognitive dissonance as they try and process the conundrum of my friend is doing something shitty. I am not allowed to say it's shitty. Does not compute. What do I do? And I have seen people respond to this situation by reformulating their actual opinion on loot boxes and monetization, because the only way they could reconcile this whole conundrum was to go, yeah, actually, now I come to think of it, I like loot boxes. Sounds bizarre. I have witnessed this firsthand. I have seen someone redraft their entire moral compass on demand to justify what they're doing. So when people tell me this or that YouTuber gets invited to these events and has a close relationship with developers, but I think he does a good job of being honest and staying impartial. Well, it's simply not possible. You see, YouTubers say this shit all the time and it's just not possible. They're trying to convince you, maybe they're trying to convince themselves, but it's just not how life works. They know if they run their mouths off or get too critical, the free parties and the paid for trips will dry up overnight. You can't have it both ways. You can't please everyone and be 100% honest when you're in the marketing business. I'm sorry, they might not be complete sellouts. The YouTuber 
most likely has convinced themselves that they do a good job of being impartial, but it's bullshit really. The following categories have different roles and responsibilities. Friends, business associates, employees, journalists. If you're a reviewer and you have any form of relationship with anyone in the video game industry, you are constantly going to have to measure your words so you don't offend, second guess what you're about to say, and avoid saying anything that will damage your relationships, be they personal or professional, and by professional I mean shilling. This is the point. This is why publishers spend so much time flying YouTubers out to events. If they did not profit from doing this, they would not be able to justify the internal budget and the publishers would stop doing it. Get it? This is a money game and it obviously works because they pay a lot of money for it. Nothing I'm saying is controversial, it's just human nature, something that I am fortunate enough not to have to involve myself with. But video game journalists can't write reviews about video games while simultaneously not hurting anyone's feelings, not pissing off the sponsors, not pissing off the advertisers, not pissing off the publishers, not pissing off their friends and contacts who worked on the game. Actually, this is exactly what they fucking do. And this is also why most genuine video game journalism vanished down the shitter years ago. When trying to navigate bias, influence and downright shilling, there are, however, a few huge red flags that you can keep an eye out for. If a YouTuber gets invited to big swanky events, well they're probably on the payroll. Do they regularly get early access copies so their review is published on the day of release? Well, that's a huge red flag too. It means they're compliant and someone they can predict and do business with. Seriously, check the dates that people publish their reviews. If they had time to play the game, make the video and publish it on the day of launch, congratulations, you have successfully smelled a rat. Does the YouTuber get regular access to high profile people for exclusive interviews? Because no fucker gets that kind of access without signing NDAs and promising to stay completely on topic. I mean seriously, when have you ever seen a lead designer or a creative director or a video game rock star get asked a serious, hard journalistic question in an interview? You never see someone like Yves Guillemot on stage suddenly blown into a flap because someone suddenly asked him about the Ubisoft sexual assault scandal because all the people asking the questions are paid off on the payroll and on message. In fact, does the YouTuber regularly mention NDAs that they've signed? Because that is actually a subliminal humble bragging confession. They are unconsciously informing you about how embedded they are in the gaming industry. It's some kind of weird psychoanalytic ego response. It's a bit like how serial killers always leave clues because unconsciously they want to get caught. So do your due diligence. Check the YouTuber's Twitter bio and details. They might literally say stupid shit like Ubisoft star player or some other humble bragging about their affiliations with a publisher or developer. That's a conflict of interest right there. I mean they are literally telling you that they work for a publisher. But there are more subtle signs than that. If they list their email and say business inquiries only, well you might want to consider whose business are they trying to attract? I mean maybe they're just in a hurry to sell bull shavers and bullshit land titles in Scotland. But business inquiries only is one of the most common things I see on shill bios. Variety streamer is another red flag. But this one's a bit more complicated. Let's just say this does not automatically mean that you're open for business, but it's a very common bio for people that I factually know are open for business. It's a bit like having a red light bulb in your bedroom in Amsterdam. You are informing passers by that you are a prostitute, even though a few people might not actually realise 
that they're telling everyone that they're a prostitute. It is certainly seen as an indicator by many in the industry that you are open to taking commissions for playing games on request and saying nice things whilst you do so. And always be suspicious of anyone who bangs on about positivity, be that in forums, social media or in videos. It's a community management strategy, it's a neutralisation response. If some publisher does something shitty and you see people tub thumping and chanting the mantra of positivity and criticising negativity in the community, you can bet your ass they're working with the community managers. It's a huge red flag. Remember what I said about review bombing? This is exactly the same shit. Ring fence criticism and complaint, rebrand it as negativity, start banning and censoring people for negativity. Same shit, different platform. Now I can think of exceptions to every rule here. These are a template, not a biblical text. I know one, maybe two creators that get early access copies and still give relatively honest reviews. Similarly, I also know a few creators who are seemingly genuine most of the time, but not beyond lying through their fucking teeth if a publisher comes along with a seductive enough deal. And that's the point really. You develop trust in them, right up until the moment that they try and sell you some shitburger live service pile of fuck, you spunk a ton of cash on it, and maybe even convince yourself that it's good. For a while. And it's only months later that you realise you should have dropped that $100, on two other games that were better. Sadly, the only really watertight solution to corrupt mainstream reviewers and corrupt YouTube reviews is this. Wait until a month after launch, then see what the players are saying, and maybe watch someone streaming it. It's easy to persuade people that the train isn't going to crash before the fact, but once the game has become a train wreck, after a month, there'll be plenty of debris strewn around the track. But trust me on this, most YouTubers are at best highly subjective, at worst they're basically carefully managing their promotional contracts with publishers and trying to maintain their outward reputation as credible impartial sources of information, whilst hoovering up as much PR cash as they can stuff down their pants. And don't be fooled by a creator making a critical review once in a while. Even shills have to periodically dunk on games, sometimes controversially. This fact alone does not an honest reviewer make. It's important that they periodically give negative reviews to create the aura of genuineness. If they gave every game a positive review, they'd look like clowns. Or maybe the shopping channel. But there are other reasons too. Believe it or not, and I got this first hand. Sometimes, very, very naughty publishers pay YouTubers to shit on games made by their competitors. Allegedly. Yes indeedy, apparently it's not unheard of for publishers to pay marketing companies so that they can pay YouTubers to dunk on the competition. I might be particularly and acutely cynical, but I had my reasons. Back when I started out making Division videos, I watched firsthand as a whole cohort of my peers gradually got seduced, sold out, and turned into a bunch of rabid dogs fighting for scraps at the table. I had literally watched chats where one prospective star player was railing on another successful star player behind his back because they got picked first and saw his enraged comments about how he'd clocked up more charity money Therefore, he should have been picked first. It was truly hilarious, to be honest. I got the impression that they all hated each other's guts behind each other's backs. But on social media, they were all smiles and air kisses. And this brings me on to another point. Charity armour. For some reason, part of becoming a fully paid up shill, with certain publishers at least, seems to demand charity work. I don't know if it's some PR metric, a human shield against criticism or a profile raising mechanism for the corporation itself. Maybe it's something to do with ESG, but for some strange reason certain publishers, especially Ubisoft, seem to demand their guys clock up a certain amount of charity streams and fundraising as a vocational precursor 
for qualifying as a star player. I think it's probably a combination of all these factors. I knew some of these guys and they didn't give a flying fuck about starving penguins in Africa. They'd shoot the homeless given the opportunity, but for some reason, charity work is a thing. I'm not saying that charity work means someone is a shill, because I have mates who have done genuine charity work, but it is great moral high ground to cower behind and I regularly see a lot of shills humble brag about it all day long. It's not a litmus test, but I would say if you're starting to have your suspicions about a YouTuber and they've mentioned NDAs in a conversation and then segue into talking about their charity work, I would become very, very suspicious immediately. Now I know, I know, some people will be thinking, well that is a very cynical view to take. And maybe some people will be tacking on the words, well done, at the end of it. Maybe I am cynical, but here is why. I have seen too many shills humble bragging about their charity work and how many fucking unicorns they've rescued from oil rigs, impressing upon the audience how modest they are about all the goodness they have done in the world. Well, if they were as moral as they claim, how do they reconcile taking money from publishers, concealing this fact, and then gaslighting their fans? Stick that in your fucking unicorn and light it. Look, most YouTubers would sell you asbestos underwear if the money was good. Just look at them. They promote expensive Japanese chef's knives that are made in China with D-tier stainless steel and a bad heat treat. They will sell you a parcel of land, conferring the title of Scottish Lord, even though this is all apparently a lie. There is no land, no trees are being planted, and the statement, you get the title of Lord, is factually and legally false. Are they really trying to say that everyone who owns a house in Scotland is a Lord? They promote games like Raid Gambling Legends, which is just about the perfect storm of pay to win addiction technologies, and pretty much everything wrong with modern video games. Their sponsors are more important than their audiences and they have demonstrated this time and time again. It's about the grift. Now I'm not saying capitalism is bad, and I wholly support the idea that YouTubers make a bit of cash from promoting products. I just think they should be decent products, products worthy of your audience and viewers, not blatantly poor products that misrepresent what you are getting, allegedly. I would be doing it myself if I could find a decent sponsor that would do business with me, if I could find a product that is worthy of my audience. Something like Sig Sauer, Raytheon, British Petroleum. All those dudes who make those fucking legendary autonomous artillery vehicles. But not Heckler and Koch. They went woke. Nonces. Promoting stuff is fine, but if you want a metric of the integrity of a YouTuber, just look closely at the small print of the crap they peddle you. They know what the small print is. Their lawyers have probably read it twice. I would strongly advise everyone to be highly sceptical of any YouTuber and constantly keep count of the red flags. Maybe you're lucky and you've found one of the few keepers, but never stop paying attention. I guess the big takeaway to all of this could be summed up thusly. To paraphrase and adapt a quote from the late James Yeager, God rest his soul, there are only two types of YouTubers, shills, and potential candidates. Find new ways to find good games. Word of mouth, Steam charts, speak to tramps sitting in doorways, check out your friend's game activity and DM them questions about what they're playing. Find a Discord server you're not banned from and talk to your friends. Find reviewers that review obscure indie games who don't have any visible signs of corporate affiliation. Worth a buy seems to review everything. I frequently like different games than he does, but I can work out from his opinion whether I might like it. Do Google searches like video game cult classics. Work smart. Just never ever Google 
the game releases for next month and start racking up some pre-orders. Do your due diligence and check the receipts. Don't just drool into your keyboard, google the name of the game, then face plant onto some bullshit woke Kotaku article written by some blue haired polyamorous activist and take it on faith that their rambling diatribe about The Last of Us 2 being a masterpiece in deconstructing traditional familial gender roles is anything other than festering ideologically driven drivel. Due diligence and checking the receipts means a bit more than just passively soaking up the bought and paid for articles that Google's paid search mechanisms funnel into your chops. You need to be at least a little proactive when checking out video games, and this automatically comes with the assumption that any video game that is still during its active promotion cycle is paying people to pump out fluff pieces, exhorting how super stoked they are to play this game when it's finally released. There are better ways to judge a game. Go on Metacritic! If the critics' reviews are all negative and the user reviews are positive, chances are it's good. And the opposite is true too. Only kidding, but it is strangely true the majority of the time. If it's on Steam, go check out the user reviews. Not just the raw scores, but spend some time reading the actual reviews and taking a note of when the reviews were written. The reviews might be weighted because it had a bad launch or because it had an unpopular patch, so look at it with a bit of detail. You'll not only get a handle on how customers rate the game, but what they like and dislike, possible pitfalls and maybe even work out if it's a sort of game you might dislike despite being objectively good. There might even be a warning in there along the lines of known bugs that might conflict with some piece of kit that you have in your PC. Go and watch some Let's Plays. Not reviews, but actual playthroughs. Just be very careful about how you do it. Let's Plays will show you a bit about how the game actually plays, but bear in mind that publishers have a budget to pay their shills to stream games. Remember what I said earlier about variety streamers? Yeah, this. If someone is streaming Assassin's Creed Boredom XP Booster 5, just take a few moments to scrutinise the channel their social media footprint and their Twitter bio. Chances are, if they're on the payroll, they will have some link to Ubisoft. Maybe they're a former star player or some other sort of affiliate, or just regularly taking a paycheck. Try and work this out, because if it's true, their opinion is worth less than a tramp's nappy and probably even less savoury to be around. Similarly, consider the heritage and legacy of the publisher. EA lie through their teeth, habitually release titles without telling anyone that they're live service, then do minimal support until it is eventually just about running properly over the first year and then they abandon it. So you can rightly assume, if they announce a new Battlefield game, it will be absolute shit at launch, reasonably shit a year later, and still not worth the money when it's on sale for 7 bucks in a Steam sale just like the last two Battlefield games. Bethesda, lie through their teeth, blah blah fucking blah, only they usually rely on modders to fix their games for free. They made some of the best and worst games ever made, so you know with them it's a crapshoot. Similarly, don't take profiles on face value. If you are interested in a game, do a simple check, find the game on Steam or Wikipedia, Click on the developer, click on the publisher, it takes about 3 minutes to figure out their background and what other games they've been involved with. Go and read the reviews of those games. They might have a legacy of abandoning games after 6 months. Most of the so-called research I do takes a few minutes on Wikipedia or following links on Steam. Trust me, if this shit was any easier, then mainstream video game journalists would be doing it too between Instagram posts about BLM and socially marginalised groups. I guess it's time we stuffed these puppies into the sack and threw it into the river. Most of the pain and disappointment gamers experience is entirely avoidable, and it could be entirely avoided by following a few simple rules, conducting a little due diligence, and exercising a modicum of self-control, and making sure that you never pre-order.
but frequently I see gamers falling for the same old tricks, time and time again. Einstein once famously did not say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Not only is it an urban myth that he said that, but it's a pretty shit description of insanity. I once saw this mental guy spitting at loads of different passers-by and the abuse he was screaming was different every time. Now he wasn't expecting any kind of results and judging by the fact that when the police turned up, he got his cock out and started wanking at the female police officer, I am quietly confident he is as fucking mental as a brain damaged raccoon. So I will use a different analogy. Video game customers sometimes remind me of that really old joke about the builder complaining about his sandwiches in his packed lunchbox. He sits there every day, bitching and moaning about the fact that every single goddamn day he sits down for lunch, he opens his lunchbox and it's the same shitty cheese sandwiches. One day another builder says to him, why don't you just tell your wife to make you a different sandwich for a change? And the builder turns around and replies, wouldn't make any difference. I make them. Do not pre-order and then complain that you got ripped off. Just stop pre-ordering. Start doing a tiny little bit of research. Stop banging your head against a brick wall. Let other people play the game for a month, year or more. Buy it later, for cheaper, when you know it's good. There are very few ways for video game publishers to scam you unless you actively go out of your way to volunteer for the castration, stand in the line and wait for the hammer to hit your balls. Publishers are guilty of many, many crimes and moral abuses, but nobody can claim it's their fault that you pre-ordered a shit game. But for now, good luck and happy hunting.